there's another verse I'm going to read along with that as well, which is in the same chapter. I want to make an addition. Because this might make some good conversation. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 31. It says, and, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And now go back up to um, verse 7 of chapter 4. It says, And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, and, and notice, filled with the Holy Spirit, I, I want to just mark that out, because there's some things that I want to talk about in reference to the doctrine statement, what it says. Uh, so just, just a, a, a footnote to yourself in your head. Chapter 4, verse 8, 7 and 8, and then also 4, 31. Now go to uh, the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians. Uh, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. It is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to, to the redemption of his own possession to the praise of his glory. And there's the sealing of the Holy Spirit. In the same book, Ephesians, and we go to chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, go to verse 30. We brought this up last time. Somebody brought this up last time. Um... Ephesians 4, verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You can't seal a force. You, excuse me, you can't grieve a force. Uh, you, you grieve people. So that's a, a proof text, so to speak, of, how, of the personality of the Holy Spirit. But now go to the book of Titus. Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. Two more passages we're going to look at, Titus, and then 1 John, Titus, and then 1 John. <clears throat> uh, Titus 3, 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. There's a regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about few moments. And then last, 1 John 4.13, 1 John 4.13, 1 John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude Revelation. So 1 John 4.13, 1 John 4.13, by this, we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. Um, so those are verses that I want us to look at <clears throat> in connection to uh, uh, God the Holy Spirit. Some, some, just some questions or uh, additions, concerns. In the statements... Uh, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, fully divine. He inspired holy men of old to write the scriptures. Through illumination, he enables men to understand the truth. He exalts Christ, convicts men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Then the one section says, he calls men to the Savior and affects regener regeneration. Uh, and um, Kind of to unpack that a little bit more, um, he calls men, that is the effectual call, the calling that produces an effect, which brings about regeneration. They go together. And the fruits of regeneration are repentance and faith, which is going to be discussed uh, underneath salvation when we come to that in a few moments. But I, I do want to highlight as well, uh, at the end of that statement, God the Holy Spirit, it says, He enlightens and empowers a believer in the church in worship, evangelism, and service. 
something we could have looked at is uh, Ephesians 5.18. Do not be filled with wine for that dissipation, but be filled by the Holy Spirit. So there's two aspects of the filling, at least I believe there's two aspects of the filling. One aspect is empowering us for ministry, just like he did with Peter in Acts chapter 4. And another is in reference to living out the Christian life. Be filled by the Holy Spirit with the fullness of God, which is in connection to the truth as we're obedient to God's truth. So I believe there's two aspects of that. Some don't believe that. Some believe there's, there's only one aspect of the, of, uh, of the filling, that is Ephesians 5.18 aspect. So, but that's, uh, I, guess I wanted to throw that. That's where that comes from. So, yeah, Tim. What you just said, and my question is, and also you believe that that happens at the point, uh, the moment of regeneration when the Holy Spirit that both of those? No, it happens... Um, all the t it can uh, how do I put that um, bing, bing, bing. at different times there's an empowerment that I believe comes from the Holy Spirit for ministry mm -hmm. and then there's a, a, there's a filling that comes by the Holy Spirit to be filled with the fullness of God to live out the Christian life and that comes and goes now that's different because uh, comes it's and different goes from the actual uh, From the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, so that's different. Which in the indwelling is different from even the sealing of the Holy Spirit, which is like Ephesians. We looked at Ephesians 1 14. He was sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And you're saying those two are different? Or which? So this is just one aspect. The, the indwelling is not necessarily the sealing, but because you're indwelt, you're sealed. The sealing aspect is it has the idea of ownership. Not to say that they're, um, not to say that uh, these are not connected because they are, but we have to make sure that we understand this is one aspect of the Holy Spirit, this is another aspect of the Holy Spirit. You can't have one without the other, in other words. Exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say, you're saying you can be indwelled but not sealed? No, that can't happen. That's why they're connected together. You can't have one without the other, but we just don't want to say that, well, the sealing is the indwelling and the indwelling is the sealing. Well, not necessarily. Those are two different ministries of the Holy Spirit. And then you have the other, boy, this one is just gone. Let's see if this one. Oh, that's better. You have a filling. And underneath that, there's empowerment. And then also, uh, how can I put that? Uh, what would be a way to put that, Daniel? Sanctifying? Or? Yeah, uh, sanctification. So, so in what, what way would the, the understanding differ than a Pentecostalish type of understanding where you get like a second anointing? Oh. Uh, because traditionally, uh, they're into the filling. Well, they're into filling as a manifestation or a showing. They, they say it's a one-time event. I don't think that's true. Have you received, you remain, have you received the Holy Spirit? Right. The so for them, it's uh, level one Christian, um, you know, faith. The more mature, the more evidence of the Holy Spirit working. Intense. And then level two Christian, um, speak in tongues. That's the evidence, that's the level two you come up to. So, so they, they connect this with this, and it's a one-time event for them. Where, uh, don't, don't, do not get drunk with wine for that dissipation, but be filled by the Holy Spirit. And it's actually, but like, keep being filled, because it's present tense. So it's not a one-time event, you continue to be filled. And if you know a connection with Ephesians was written at the same time as Colossians, and and uh, Paul says in Colossians, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual song. The same outflow of letting Christ's word dwell within you is the same outcome as when you're filled by means of the Holy Spirit with the fullness of God. Which means that for you to have the filling and the sanctification aspect, 
is connected to Scripture and your obedience to it. Does that make sense? Is it like yielding yourself more completely to the yes. Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes. So Which is yielding Spirit. yourself more completely to right. the Word of God. They go together. They go hand in hand. Because it's a, it's a living out the Christian life because he says, in contrast to that, you're getting drunk with wine. You're being controlled by wine. Another thing, filling... Uh, it's the opposite of grieving the Holy Spirit. You, you, you yield more completely. The aspect of dominance. What's dominating you? Yeah, Dean, when we go in. Um, John 15. The whole... Uh, John spends a lot of time talking about abiding in God, God abiding in you. Abide in love. God's love will abide in you. How does all this fit in with abiding? Who does the abiding? Who controls the abiding? Who initiates the abiding? I'm trying to understand your question. We're told to abide in Christ. We're first told to come to Christ. We all did. And then we're told to abide in Christ. We have a responsibility. Is it ours? Is it the Holy Spirit's? Is the Holy, where is that in here? Are you talking about the Holy Spirit? We can only abide in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Which of those terms does that? I don't know if I could bring that into the mix because it seems like the abiding in Christ might be something separate from reference to the Holy Spirit. I, I although think more, I think it has more to do with the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, yeah, obviously, because in so, chapter 14 he talks about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but then there's also the. I want to. I want to make sure I'm, I'm being careful with the ministry that we have with Jesus and what He commands us to do, and then the actual things that the Holy Spirit is doing in us, which comes into chapter 16. Where he convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's in reference to the unsaved, uh, to the world. But um, so I, don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question well, right, or I don't know. Not, gonna, maybe somebody else gets it. I, I'm not getting it. I, I know that we're commanded to abide. We're, we're repeatedly commanded to abide in Christ, right. abide in his love throughout Paul, John, Peter, all of them. Um, but we can only do that with the power of the Holy Spirit. So you're describing the Holy Spirit and the thing in His ministries, His empowerment, right. sanctification, His feeling. Which of those terms? Wh where do we get the power to abide? We're told to abide. We have to abide. We can only abide with the Spirit, by the Spirit, through the Spirit. It could even be a, his job. A, a sort of a fourth category for your. I mean, there's, um, there's probably even more than four works of the Holy Spirit. But regenerating, it all starts with God changing our hearts through the Holy Spirit to to want to abide. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. That, and so God is the, the ultimately the initiator of the work, including sanctification in our lives. But we respond, we we yield control to the Holy Spirit. Um, so. And maybe maybe what you're I just I never had anybody asked that before. So I just want to just kind of like trying to. What think. I find in, in, yeah. a, maybe in it's quite a few churches is nobody teaches anything about abiding in Christ. It's more of that. And yet it's a pretty big command. Yeah. Every bit as much as come. We responded to the come. Where are we responding to the abide? Maybe that's what the connection is. That's a good question. I'd have to think and study that. Good question. So, what's out there? Uh, Mark, you were going to say something? I think it, uh, when I think of abiding, that means to reside with, to live with, or to commune with. You're abiding with somebody. You know, like, you're abiding, you're, you're walking along the way with them. There's this exchange that's taking place. So I'm really thinking it's more of like this sealing process where we have chosen to reside, where the Holy Spirit has chosen to abide with us and we abide with Him. There is a, uh, a relationship that forms. We have a relationship with God and God has a relationship with us. Therefore, uh, the Holy Spirit lives and in, indwells with us, and we in, in, we are the manifestation of His gifts in the church. I think the reason why I, I would not say it's sealing because sealing is the idea of ownership, and it's something separate that's brought up by Paul. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to mix Paul with John or John with Paul. Mm -hmm. If I want to know what, I mean, it's just an issue of when you when you do an interpretation, you always want to start with the book within the own context and then go outside of that um, and just as I was kind of, even while you were talking to Mark you brought up something I don't know if you realize it um, but in, ter in terms of the commands because he says abide in me in 15 if 
you abide in me and my words abide in you, so there's a connection to obedience to his word, by this the Father glorify you bear much fruit, proving to be my disciples. As far as love me, I also love you. Abide in my love. So there's a connection when you abide in Jesus. There's a, when you're listening to his words, it means you're going to abide in his love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just like my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So you're being obedient to God's commands. And probably the empowerment that's going to be able to, for you to be able to do that is going to be the filling. That's where the ministry of the Holy Spirit will come in. But see, that's just off the cuff. I'll ask again. And after, I just, let's move on because I don't want to yeah. get too much time. Said yeah. that when you get saved, you get a hundred percent of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Then, you, so because the Pentecostals don't think that's true. Right. I've had this conversation right. with them, and that would be with this understanding in the aspect of the indwelling. Right. It's this. Um, uh, there's some like MacArthur. John MacArthur does not believe in this. He would not take this view of empowerment unless things have changed. Uh, I disagree with him in that regard. So, and I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm just saying that that I just there's a disagreement that I've had that I have with him in reference to that because, it, but I, in my own viewpoint, I think that what, the reason why he does that is because it's a reaction to this. Oh yeah. Which has been, mm -hmm. which minimizes. Right. It minimizes this. Yeah, that's where my questions says, are coming from. You're a, you're a second-class Christian. You're right. not really a Christian until you speak in tongues. It's, right. it, it's really the emphasis that it becomes. Who was telling me? Somebody was telling me that they were they grew up in an Assembly of God church. Well, anyways, somebody was saying they grew up in an Assembly of God church, and there's the pressure to have to try and speak in tongues, yeah. or else you're not just in. Yeah. It's like, what's the what? Wasn't that you? Oh, I knew somebody yeah. told me that. I mean, the, the pressure, the, the pressure. You're forced. If, if you don't speak in tongues, then you don't have power. Mm. Ah, right. What? And, they, and the, then they go hand in hand with the prosperity gospel, where mm. if, oh, you, yeah. if you, if you, if you yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You just don't have uh, it. I'm not, is speaking in tongues just learning a different language, like right off the top? <laughs> What is it? Oh, there you go. Oh, man. You go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll skip next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> That's just uh, Wow. <laughs> what I believe is it's a real language. <laughs> we could all have a different belief. What I think is very clear, we'll find this out when we come to 1 Corinthians 14, and then you'll see what the real view is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the real view. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very apparent that it's, it's a real language. Pentecostals will not see it that way, or the second wave or third wave charismatics. They will not see it that way. They think it's 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 a, a language that you have with God. Mm -hmm. Lama Bama, Kodama. It's unintelligible. I just think that's yeah, and unbiblical. Yeah. I I don't believe that, but I mean, they, we'll see what First Corinthians fourteen because there's a there's a verse that they use in there to try and prove that point. So this is a great question. But unfortunately, we have to move on. And I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Roman numeral three, man. We've glossed right over the Holy Spirit. You know? I know. I mean, come on. It's a, tough, it's a tough issue. It's it's a it is. No, I think that's a good question. I think it's a really good question. Um, people debated that for a long time. Uh, man, man is the special creation of God made in his own image. He created male and female as the crowning work of his creation. The gift of gender is thus part of the goodness of God's creation. Beginning, man was innocent of sin and was endowed by his creator with freedom of choice. By his free choice, man sinned against God and brought sin into the human race. Through the redemption, excuse me, through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command of God, excuse me, and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity inherit a nature and an environment inclined towards sin. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are under condemnation. Only the grace of God can bring man into his holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the creative purpose of God. The sacredness of human personality is evident in that God created man in his own image and in that Christ died for man. Therefore, every person of every race possesses full dignity and is worthy of respect and Christian love. Take your Bibles and let's do a couple of these verses. Genesis 1, 26 to 30. Genesis 1. Can you read that? 
Genesis 1, uh, 26 through 30 for us. <clears throat> then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant, yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit, yielding seed, it shall be food for you, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, every green plant for food, and it was so. Now turn to the middle of your Bibles to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, go to verse 5. Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and sin my mother conceived me. Keep going forward in your Bibles to Jeremiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 and verse 9, verse 5 and verse 9, verse 5, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Verse 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Um, let's go to... The Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. Matthew 16, 26. Matthew chapter 16. And then go to verse 26. Will a man be, for what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then go to Romans. The book of Romans. Chapter 3. Romans 3.10. Romans 3.10, Romans chapter 3, verse 10, 10 and 11, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. Drop down to verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know, verse 19, that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And then go, go like a page or two over to, to chapter 5. 5 verse 6. I'm sorry, that's 6. Verse 12. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Chapter 5 verse 12. This is the classic statement by which um, Paul explains how man fell and how it's passed down to man. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. I'll unpack that later on in just a moment. And then, excuse me, uh, go to 1 Corinthians, the book we're studying on Sunday for our service. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, 19. 15, 19. Fifteen, verse 19. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. 
But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Verses I wanted us to read. Um, any thoughts or comments about the statement in a reference to man? There's a couple things I want to bring up. Who sure makes the gospel look sweet? Why? What do you mean? Well, that's that's complete condemnation. Yes. Yeah. No hope whatsoever. Makes the gospel. But. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. That's true. That's good. Thank you. Praise Jesus. I've had a question for a long time, and I think that verse in Psalms might answer it. And I just wanted to ask you. Uh, it says in uh, Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So would that be evidence of you acquiring your spirit at conception? <laughs> wow, I never... I don't think I've heard that verse used or something like I'm that. I'm asking, so... I've always wondered at what point do we receive our spirit? Because we are different than animals in that regard. Mm -hmm. Is it at conception? And then if you can receive sin, your spirit is condemned to hell. Yeah, there's there's two views on that. Uh, the one view which uses Ecclesiastes, which makes a, like a vague point that uh, excuse me that. I think this is where the Mormons get it, um, that God puts the Spirit and has the Spirit or does something and puts the Spirit in man. Mm. I can't remember the name of that view. The existence of the soul? That it that you exist as a spirit? Person no, no, no. Okay. This, it's, it's within orthodoxy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's within orthodoxy. Yeah, seriously. Uh, I'd have to look at my notes from the, um, Theology 2. Anthropology. I think the second view, I'm not sure about this, I have to look at the transducian view. The transducian view, I think this is what it's called, where actually uh, when a man and a woman come together and it produces a child, they are actually given the power by which they bring about another person has a spirit. They're actually in that process. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, so one view is like God has the spirits here. Another view is we are actually a part of, of doing that. Mm -hmm. We're involved in that process, and God providentially oversees that. Those are the two views. As we impute sin to the child. Yes. And that, that's why it's, it's, it's passed down. Not only is the spirit there, uh, which is kind of, but also obviously the, the sinful nature. Well, I guess my question is, if we do not hold to the view that at the point of conception, man is a spiritual being different than animals, then what would be the logical conclusion is, now we're on the slippery slope of, okay, now when in this process does this actually occur? That's what distinguishes us from animals, is this process that you've got here, this sin comes into the fray, and is part of this process, in my opinion. And I'm probably not doing justice to the two views because I haven't looked at my notes in a while, but um, uh, just kind of dovetailing off of what Mark said, it, the reason why I, I, I can't take, personally I couldn't take the first view, and some evangelicals do, is because it just seems kind of weird to me that God has some spirits over here and he gives that into that conception and happens. Like a spirit bank or something? Yeah, it's, it's really, then you, it, you, it, it, you can very easily move into that Mormonism type the mentality that there's spirits that are alive and then God mm -hmm. puts them in like that. Because that's, that's the Mormonism. Mormons. But, but we do know that it, it does occur. Something happens. Something happens. And, and, and what that is, of course, that's probably you know subjective. So It's, it's hard for us because the Bible right. is silent on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was thinking it was uh, when you made it a decision, a conscious decision to accept Christ, then your the Spirit comes in and does its job, right? Well, the, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, yes. Oh. Yeah, so you're right on that, yes. What we're speaking about is an actual human spirit, which I believe is 
the soul as well. Mm-hmm. And a daikon. Mm-hmm. Daikon. daikon. Right. At what point does a child receive the spirit? At what point does a child receive the soul? And, and I believe it's actually, we are a part of that process. And well, procreation. kind of tagged with the soul, right? What's that? You're kind of tagged with the soul. Kind of like, it just, it's there. I mean. Yeah. If they're asking when. Yeah, we're asking when. When does it happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, it's, it's kind of. Yeah, I was wondering if that verse in Psalms kind of pointed to, since that's when you got sin, was it conception? Well, can you really right. have sin without a spirit? Or a soul. Or a soul. Or a soul, because that is the actual... Can an animal have like sin? No. Right. Yes. So, I'm sure. to me, that kind of implies you do receive your uh, soul at conception. I don't know. Well, we Again, wouldn't be I've a never, without a soul. We wouldn't be human without a soul. Right. We are different we have than to animals. Have when that happens, I mean, I've never, again, I've never heard that verse used for that, but I'm, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be. I'm just... I don't know. Just, yeah, Sandy. That's probably one of those things that we're sure. I don't think you've got there yet. One of those things I was like, yeah, well, uh, that's some of the conclusion I came to in class. I never remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know that. Anyways. I'm sorry, I didn't know. What did she say? Oh, what did you say, Sandy? I said that's probably one of the things that we're not supposed to know. <laughs> oh. I would like to point out, if you notice, uh, almost in the middle of the statement where it says, therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, you see what that says in the statement? They become transgressors and are under condemnation. Uh, I, I really, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think that, that's, that's, that's a problem. Um, because, first of all, actually, look, look at the statement before that. Through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command of God, notice, and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity inherited a nature and an environment inclined towards sin. And I believe that's true, right? You have Adam, right? And from him, All right? Sin. We, 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 have, we, we get a sinful nature, right? Right. But that's not only that, because Romans chapter 5, verse 12, which that's why I, I made mention of that, through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Mm-hmm. All of us were in Adam. All of us were in Adam. This is actually called the headship view. Is it were or are? Is it, I mean, uh, you, you, you place like a, a past tense or a Present tense. Because it, it already happened. happened. If, it was, if we were there, it would have been, we are in Adam. If mm-hmm. we were there at that time, but since it's past, now it's we. Okay, we're we'll see the context. We were there in Adam. It's the headship, also known as a federal view, which you might know about this because that's Presbyterian. Yeah, me and the Presbyterians don't agree on everything. <laughs> yes. I'm not saying that you would agree, but you would know that. The federal yeah. headship view. Yeah, the, I one think of the questions I always had is you're saying we were in Adam. Yeah. Uh, not he represented us, but we were actually part of him. I believe both. It, that it's it's a headship. He he was the head over us, and he re- and therefore thus he represented us. Right. And so when he sinned, he plunged us all into sin. And, and the reason why this is important is because if it's strictly this, if it's just strictly this, I'm not saying it could happen, but you could come to the aspect where you start to question the incarnation. Because Jesus was human. So it's not, it cannot strictly be this. I think it has to be part of this and this. It has to be both. That, but I mean, that's... Well, definitely what's being, what's being said is we are sinners, right? That's yeah. what's being said. Right. I'm just being nitpicky. Because I'm supposed to be nitpicky, right? Well, I think we grow when we get a little nitpicky because if we just, I don't, you know, I don't know that. that. Or, or just, just, there's always room for another denomination or something. <laughs> <laughs> Southern, Southern. <laughs> but then it, it also leads to the next statement. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are un, under condemnation. Yeah, I think that's a little. So you have a problem with that then? Yeah, because humans are already transgressors and condemned before moral action. I would agree. Yeah, they have violated moral code immediately. Yeah. 
So it goes to the nature. Even even if you're at a point where you can't actually take action upon that nature, you still have it. You're going to. Right. Mm -hmm. Period. Right. You're going to do it. And you cannot escape it. And that's the danger is in what ends up happening is you being to question imputed, right? Uh, imputed sin. Um, and maybe the reason why they did this is because so that way you can say something about infants when they die. So how do you handle that then? What are you going to say, Dave? Well, I actually was going to be my question. Yeah. I know where you're going. Good. I know where you're going. Keep good. Well, if they're born in sin, right? Yet they're not held morally culpable if they die before they are able to develop a moral, uh, and before they, you know, they can't accept Jesus at the point where they don't have any real understanding. And you would deduce that they would have to go to hell, right? Well, yeah. That would be the logical progression. That would be the logical progression. Right. right. I understand that. And I think that's why that statement's put in there. But even though, even though we believe, um, we believe in imputed sin, no matter if they have. Uh, capable of moral action be, as soon as they're capable of moral action even if they do have that do we not believe in the grace of God? I mean Amen. we can say that right? Amen. Now, now some have taken the viewpoint that no that's because babies do end up going to hell I, you know what? the Bible doesn't say that the Bible is very silent on that stuff but let's just know that how about we just know that God is going to be good and he's going to be merciful as he sees fit Give mercy on those who give mercy. The child's not aware of his sinful nature until a certain point. Right. And that's, he, I agree with that. But he still has broken the moral code or the, the law. It was still this. He has violated, yes. He's still part of that. And right. and even, even it's not just this. He still, he or she still has a sinful nature Absolutely. that's passed down to them. Yes. Whether they're actually responded in that by making a decision or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But it doesn't, I don't think it necessitates, well, then that means I have to go to hell. Well, maybe we just trust that God's going to do what he's going to do, and we just let that go, and we say, God, we know we know that you know what you're doing. Right. There's, there's plenty, of, plenty of evidence in Scripture that God loves his people. Christian parents have a child who dies. If God is merciful, you have hope in that. You trust in his providence. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're going to say, Every one of us, I'm going to let some of them, every one of us sitting here have made a decision for Christ. We're all going to heaven. Fair statement. Every one of us sitting here has a sin nature, and we're going to heaven. If we sin, 1 John 1 9, we ask repentance and then we're cleansed. If we haven't sinned, we don't have to ask for forgiveness. We haven't sinned. Babies haven't yet sinned. They have a sinful nature, but they haven't sinned. There's no need for repentance. There's no wall between them and God. I would take that a step further, though. Knock yourself out. It works for me. <laughs> <laughs> I did not make a decision for Christ. Christ chose me. All right, so you're going to there. To <laughs> I responded so to So people them. are sinners because they sin. We're sinners because we have a sin nature. We can't help ourselves. We're, we sin because we're sinners as we human beings. Right. So that's where I think that could end up, you could end up seeing the rub. I understand your logic in that, but where the rub could become, uh, be apparent, is when you flip that around. I'm a sinner because I sin. No, we sin because we're sinners. It's who I am through this and this. It's, it's together. And, I, but I understand I your logic. I don't disagree, but a baby I, hasn't I made an act yet. I understand your logic, but, but they're still they culpable. I'm not doubting they're culpable. Yeah. I'm not saying How are they culpable? We're sitting here sinners. All of us believe and we're headed to heaven. Well, uh, a child sin. What I'm saying is being having a sinful nature isn't what keeps you out of heaven. A baby born in a sinful nature isn't by its very nature kept from heaven. 
be and, by and, our very well, nature. And see, the other logic, too, that I, I think that could be flawed in what you're saying is, I don't believe that I have a sinful nature. I still am the flesh. My sinful nature is dead. Mm -hmm. well, that's a whole other issue. Yeah, we could argue that one. Yeah, and it's incapable of doing anything right. Because there's, there's, I believe there's two aspects, and I think it's very apparent in Paul, you go to Romans chapter 6. The old man, the old nature has died, but I still have flesh. The vestiges or remnants of sin that's still inside of me. So that, that, that creates a whole other thing. And that's where I think... I don't have a problem with the you, distinction that we have a sinful nature and we also sin. I mean, those are two distinct... A one-year-old sins all the time. Sin of pride. They're constantly wanting... Mm, it's all about right, self. Right. A one -year and, see, and that's why you're trying to figure out well, at what point that's why this statement can break down. The moral action. Well, is it seven months old? Eight? Is it two? Is it five? And who's the one who's going to determine that? And the other thing I've heard is, are they God's elect or are they not? So yeah, yeah. I've it's, also heard that. Right. You know, I've heard that. That's where the reform camp comes in, where if, if they die in infancy, then it means they're not elect, so it means they went to hell. I think... Uh, you certainly can't know they're not elect. I can't remember which reform theologian took that view, so I won't, I won't say who did, but... Um, you know, I, I just say, look, this is what the Bible says. This is passed down to us. I don't fully understand how that works for an infant. Do I believe infants go to hell? No, I just, I have a, I have a, I struggle with that. I believe God's going to be gracious and merciful as how He sees fit. But maybe He sees fit to do that. That's His business. And that's His business, Amen. and I have to trust Him in that. Amen. But I know that I must live according to what His Word says. Amen. And trust in His providence. Yes. We need to move on. I know there's more questions, and we do need to move on. Uh, um, four weeks. I doubt it. The salvation. Uh, Roman numeral four. But I see that hand, Lori. We'll sing just as I am. Two more verses, and you can come forward. <laughs> oh, that's right. You guys are coming out of that, so you better understand we this. Have, we have. Just as I'll be waiting. He's got a good scripture from Second Samuel that points about David's. Uh, he says, can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So it was like he was going to meet him in heaven. And, and I understand that that passage, but you can actually take it two ways. One is I'm going to meet in heaven. The other is I'm going to go to the grave just like he did. But I understand what you mean. I actually think the passages in, with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus blesses the children, I think that has more weight than anything else. Come yes. Me, so. so I think that has, but that, be that as it may, Roman number four, salvation involves these <laughs> three. Notice. Boy, the clarity coming out of this class. <laughs> oh, no, he's not. Salvation involves redemption of the whole man and is offered freely. Chicken. So all of it said, hey, it stays out of, keeps me out of trouble. A couple days, we'll get there. It's <laughs> offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who by his own blood obtain eternal redemption for the believer. In his broadest sense, salvation includes regeneration, justification, sanctification, and glorification. There is no salvation apart from personal faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. A, regeneration, or the new birth, is a work of God's grace whereby believers become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit through conviction of sin to which the sinner responds in repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are inseparable experiences of grace. Repentance is a genuine turning from sin toward God. Faith is the acceptance of Jesus Christ and commitment of the, of the entire personality to Him as Lord and Savior. B. Justification. God's gracious and full acquittal upon principles of his righteousness of all sinners who repent and believe in Christ. Justification brings a believer unto a relationship of peace and faith with God. C. Sanctification is the experience beginning in regeneration by which the believer is set apart to God's purposes, is enabled to progress toward moral and spiritual, mat spiritual maturity through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Growth and grace should continue throughout the regenerate person's life. Letter D, glorification, is the culmination of salvation, is the final blessed and abiding state of the redeemed. Excuse me. Uh, let's take our Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 3. The Gospel of John. Go to chapter 3. 
to read 3 through 21. I know it says that there, but uh, I'm going to pick out different verses. At chapter 3, look at verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, verse uh, 12, let's do verse 12. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one is ascended to heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Let's go to chapter 5 of the Gospel of John. Chapter 5, a couple pages over in your Bible. Go to chapter 5, verse 24. 524. 524. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. That goes to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 21. Acts 2, 21. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, go to chapter 4, verse 12. Acts 4, 12. Acts 4, 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, which is actually in context, our Lord Jesus. Now go to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, verse 30. Acts 17, 30. Acts 17, verse 30. Seventeen thirty. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men, excuse me, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now go to the book of Romans. Acts and then Romans. Romans 4. Next book over, Romans chapter 4. We'll start reading verse 3. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him and justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works, Happy are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. Happy is the man whose sin the Lord does not take into account. Amen. Mm -hmm. Chapter 10. Chapter 10 of Romans. Chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. With the heart, man believes, resulting in righteousness, the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And then if you drop, uh, not drop, go forward, verse 13 of chapter 10, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Two more passages for you. You're in Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Go to Philippians. Philippians 2, 12. Philippians 2, 12. 2, 12. Philippians 2.12 So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And one more for you. Philippians, Colossians, 1.2 Thessalonians, 1.2 Timothy, Titus. Go back to Titus. We read from Titus couple of points ago. Titus chapter 2 this time. Titus 2. Titus 2, 
Titus 2, Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God is appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Um, just a couple of points I wanted to bring up. Uh, notice in regeneration, letter A, the very end, where it says, uh, faith is the acceptance of Jesus Christ and commitment of the entire personality. I think that's weird. Why do you say personality? I think it should be person. That's just, I'm nitpicky with that. Um, I also believe faith should be delineated more. Um, faith is the acceptance of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? I, I think it should include trust in the person of Jesus Christ and his work, his life, death, and burial, and resurrection. I think that should be stated because it's, it, seems per, it seems too vague. But again, that's, that's me. I definitely think a stronger statement should be made in reference to justification, letter B. Justification is a gracious act of God whereby he declares a sinner just based solely on Christ's personhood and accomplished mediatorial substitutionary work. That should be stated. The righteousness of Jesus is imputed towards the sinner's account. That should be stated as well, I think. Um, it needs to be emphasized stronger that we are imputed with the righteousness of Christ. Where did you get those clarifying statements from? Uh, this is actually a... Um, Westminster Confession? <laughs> I, I, actually, I really don't remember. Um, it is a definition that I have of justification from what I just read to you. It might have been Westminster Confession. Or, um, it does. Westminster Confession clearly delineates that very, uh, yeah, very particularly, which I, 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 I think that should... That's, to me, that's very weak. Especially since it's, this is the heartland of the gospel. Uh, yeah. yeah. And when it says full acquittal, uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. It, it should, we're declared righteous. That should be stronger. Mm -hmm. yeah. Better than just being declared not guilty. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you're not just declared, you're not just said, not declared not guilty. You are declared righteous. Right. Because you're right, the righteous of Jesus. Right. What do you do with First John 1 9? What do I do with it? If we're, if we're declared righteous, why would we ever need to be cleansed of all unrighteousness again? Good question. What? Never can we see. I'm asking you. <laughs> Answer the question for us. I have the question. <laughs> why would I ask it if I knew the answer? I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> so I'm a lawyer then? You're a pastor. Uh, that doesn't make me a lawyer though. Makes you the expert in the room. <laughs> oh, it's now the expert. In the room. You're the man. Ah, the Be expert, the man. The expert being stupid? Cut it out. <laughs> oh, I'm getting that. Does that seem like that? It would seem like it's an, uh, it contradicts. Right. No, I understand. Although, if we take it that there's a declaration of righteousness in terms of my standing before God, and then 1 John 1 9 is my continual relationship and fellowship with God. <laughs> then it seems to iron out those things. It's the two separate yeah. things. You know, we have the yeah. same nature and we sin. <laughs> you don't have that sin nature thing, don't you? Mm -hmm. I'm ticked off at it. I'd really like to be God done with it. <laughs> Isn't that what the antinomians thought? That, that you were once righteous, you don't have to worry about sin anymore. Is that what the question is? Well, no, no, no. No, uh, no I'm nowhere near there's, there. There's no law, so therefore, <laughs> right. you know, I can do whatever I want. Yeah, Mark. Anyway, when I, you know, as I read this, I, I'm asking myself, who is the audience? Uh, who are the people that the, this writing is intended to reach? And for a lot of people, they're not very deep. They're not really, uh, they haven't gone really deep with God and into his word and stuff. So some of this is written on a very basic level. And, and so when I read this, I'm thinking, well, you know, I gotta probably cut the author of this which I'm sure is probably some committee somewhere, mm -hmm. because they're trying to, they're, they're broadening things a little bit. And I think we can overanalyze things to a certain degree. I think you're right. I think you get the gist when it comes to justification. 
I think there's enough there that really tells a person it's it's not you, it's Christ who makes you just. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that's why I can sign this and say yes, right. I believe this. Right, I agree. I agree. Um, Randy Hafner, he's pastor of North Park Baptist Church. He says it well. He says, "Do I believe what this is? Absolutely. Do, do I agree with this? Yeah. Can it be said stronger? Yeah. Yes. There's, especially there's some places like here." Things can be said much stronger. Mm -hmm. Well, and is it just give clarification. Keeping it less strong is also helps give us our spectrum within the Southern Baptist Convention itself. Uh, th that's true. Yeah. Even though, clarify that with start to alienate some. Yes, and, and that's why we can, uh, for me personally, I can, someone who does not believe in the doctrines of grace as I do, I can still have a connection and fellowship with them because we both believe in the Baptist faith and message, so we can work together in that regard. And I'm okay with that. Um, a couple of other things I want to point out, and we want to give it for a couple other statements that we got we got to be done. I was surprised that there's no mention of scripture in the process of sanctification. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. No, no didn't say anything about the Bible at all in reference to our sanctification. I was like, what? It could be just implied, though. And, and that's probably what, I mean. what it is. It, it's being implied. Yeah. Again, I'm going to bring these things out because uh, just things, pet peeves I have. But yet, I do think that it, it, it does, I can sign it and agree with it. Amen. Um, okay. I also, this, this might create a whole conversation in and of itself. Growth and grace should continue throughout the regenerate person's life. I believe growth and grace will continue. Yeah, I kind of have a problem with that word yeah. should too. Yeah. So I mean, there might not be. Say what you need to say. There might not be a, a lot of growth, but if you go from year one to year fifty, there's going to be some. Maybe a very minimal. <laughs> but that's the belief of perseverance of the saints. So yeah, it's really, well, I'm looking at overall, like the big. If you rather look inside and see. Oh, I, was, I, was, I was looking close. No, no, no. That's <laughs> like, <laughs> read the fine print. Uh, last comments or questions about this? Well, maybe they put should as in encouragement. I mean, it, it, it should. You, you should be doing this. <laughs> yeah, it's a fact. It should. <laughs> it should. <laughs> and what if it's not? Well, we'll see how far we get next week. Um, you know, you're not supposed to say anything. You just, you just nod your heads. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just being facetious. I like, I like your comments and discussion getting going. I know, and I, I feel bad. You have to, you know, try and you know, keep things tight rein. Uh, but if you have other comments or questions, talk, talk afterwards and just discuss this uh, more so because uh, obviously. And, and keep this in mind, and we can all keep this in mind. It's a statement that we all can agree on, if you, especially if you're a member here, you sign this. If you're a member, you, you've signed this. So we can agree on this. There's some things you might say, oh, that could be such fun, or that should be said differently, but overall, this is where we're at. So. Let's thank the Lord. We thank you, Father, that your word is perfect and, and uh, right to everything, to the dotted I and the cross T. And your law will not pass away at, at all. And yet we thank you that Jesus has fulfilled the law for us because we have fallen so short. And, and now we, we stand uh, before you with his righteousness imputed to us. So may we live out who you've declared us to be. Amen. You know what, I'm, I'm actually...